morning, everyone, and welcome to Wakefield Community Center. My name is Mary Lee Abrams, and I serve as the mayor of Maplewood, and I can't tell you that how much I can feel the electricity in the room. You know, on a much warmer June day in 2019, I had the privilege of cutting the ribbon to this wonderful uh, building that we have opened here. Since then, countless families, neighbors, community groups have celebrated reunions, graduations, birthdays. Last night I was here for a dinner, an annual dinner for the Ramsey County League of Local Government. People have ice skated here, snowshoed, fished at our beautiful Wakefield Lake, enjoyed the playground, which features several adaptive elements out there. You can see it. It's just a gorgeous day. The sun came out. We couldn't ask for better time to be here together. As a city, we have used this space to recognize our employees' anniversaries. We hold planning retreats here and trainings. This really is the center of our Gladstone neighborhood, which is the city's oldest section of our town. We've made significant investments over the last decade, totaling approximately $17 million. And I think all of that has put us into position for what we're gonna be celebrating today. The J.B. Vang development is one of several in the planning stages for Frost Avenue. Council has given the go ahead for another affordable housing project just a few blocks from here. We've approved a market rate apartment complex across the street from the Vang property. The Moose Lodge is for sale, just a tip for anybody. <laughs> Got to get that in there. And we have a retired fire station that we would love to see become maybe a brew pub or other entertainment venue. If all goes as planned, in a few years, this area will be buzzing with diverse mix of people and amenities. To talk more about why we are here today, I'm proud to welcome and to introduce to you the Commissioner of Minnesota Housing, Jennifer Ho. Jennifer? Well, thanks, Mayor uh, Abrams. It is a beautiful day in Maplewood, and uh, you, you are definitely a champion for all the, the beautiful amenities and the future of this town. It's great to be here. I, uh, I want to thank everybody who uh, didn't let a little snow uh, get in the way. And uh, we have guests here uh, from as far away as, as Red Lake and Grand Rapids and Duluth, and you took the the, the brunt of the storm, I, I'm sure it's really beautiful. So I just really want to thank everybody, um, whether you just had to get out of your driveway and come a little ways, or you came a long ways to be with us. It's great to be with people today. I am thrilled to announce that yesterday, December 15th, the board of directors, uh, Terry Tao is a member. Thank you, Terry, for being here today. The board of directors of Minnesota Housing approved funding selections totaling $165 million to create and preserve three things, single family homes, manufactured home communities, and affordable rental multifamily apartments. More than 2,100 homes, apartments, and manufactured home lots in all. Our single family selections highlight, um, have a, a, a certain number of things that we're trying to do. We're trying to promote home ownership, particularly among first generation home buyers and households of color. We want to add affordable homes to Minnesota's housing stock. Anybody who's reading the paper, uh, anybody who wants to buy a home, anybody who wants to sell a home is aware of uh, the rising home sale costs, what it costs to buy a home, what it costs to construct a new home. We're in a high interest rate environment for the first time in quite a long time. And we have a very, very low supply of housing, especially housing that's affordable for folks who are just trying to make that first step into home ownership. So at Minnesota Housing, our funds are used to create new homes, to uh, rehab other homes, and to provide down payment assistant loans to help households achieve their goal of home ownership. We have 37 project selections today that will impact 412 single family homes and households. Projects like, uh, we'll highlight in a little bit, eight new single family community land trust homes in Grand Rapids, Minnesota, a partnership between the Itasca County HRA, One Roof Community Housing, the IRRRB, the Iron Range Resource and Redevelopment Board, 
I think I got that right. Or, oh, Ryan says close, I'm close. We just call it the IRRRV, uh, the city of Grand Rapids in Itasca County. And we'll have a chance to dig into that uh, in just a little bit. Our manufactured housing selections uh, are really about investing in these manufactured home communities to make sure that they're viable, safe, quality of life, affordable communities for years to come. 2022 marks our third year of working in the manufactured home community space. And it's a growing area of commitment for Minnesota housing. So when we talk about infrastructure improvements, we're talking about things really fundamental to a community's health and safety. We're doing sewer and storm sewer systems, water mains, wells, streets, the addition of storm shelters to help a community member stay safe if we have a tornado or a bad weather event. Uh, this year, we're investing $9.5 million into these communities, the most that we've done in the last three years. That includes 14 manufactured home communities to be improved in six regions across the state in places like Moorhead, Redwood Falls, Medelia, Mankato, and Red Wing, a grand total of 742 manufactured home lots. So let me turn to our multifamily um, our fancy way of saying rental apartments. I, uh, we have 17 rental housing projects. That's 1,000 affordable apartments. The majority of these will be brand new apartment buildings, and the rest are rehabilitation projects to preserve uh, units into the future at prices that are affordable. About half are in the Twin Cities metro area, and about half are in greater Minnesota. A couple things that we're really proud of is for the new construction, 43% of the units are gonna be deeply affordable. Affordable to people who make 30% of the area median income or below. We're engaging more developers of color who haven't worked with Minnesota housing before. We're excited about that and that's intentional on our part. And that's part of what we have baked into the document that guides how we assign points and how we are able to choose who we work with, something called our Qualified Allocation Plan. We're pleased to have four uh, selections today that will serve Native Americans in Minnesota. And uh, a couple of them uh, are being done uh, by Red Lake Housing, and we simply know them as Jane and Linda. Jane and Linda, <laughs> thank you so much for coming down uh, from Red Lake. And thank you so much for uh, giving us these fantastic projects for the Red Lake Reservation Housing Authority, a 28 unit scattered site permanent supportive housing and 28 one story, three bedroom homes on five sites at the Red Lake Reservation. So excited uh, for, for your work and to be partnering with you on that. In addition, in the cities, we have some of the native led partners, the Native American Community Clinic is gonna redo their clinic on Franklin Avenue with, uh, with apartments above, and we're gonna do a total refresh of housing with the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, also uh, at the heart of Indian country in Minneapolis. You can get more details about our selections at our website, mnhousing.gov. Uh, there's a news release uh, that's out, and also be sure to grab a postcard when you grab a cookie uh, in back. There's a QR code that will take you to a comprehensive web page with photos, videos, and a complete spreadsheets with details of all of the selections. So we're gonna have two panels this morning. The first is gonna focus on our multifamily development that's coming soon to Maplewood, and the second is gonna focus on eight new homes to be built in Grand Rapids. So now I'd like to introduce our guests who have joined us today. I'm so grateful to have Ku Vang President of J.B. Vang Partners here with us today. Thank you, Ku, and thank you for your perseverance with our process. <laughs> we'll discuss a successful proposal um, uh, th that they've put forward, a new 65-unit apartment building located at the corner of Frost, am I pointing the right way, Frost in English, that way? That uh, just a few blocks west of here, called Gladstone Village. Um, J.B. Vang is a very accomplished developer, uh, recently selected to redevelop the Hams Brewery site and uh, this is the first uh, project financed in partnership with Minnesota Housing. So welcome, welcome Ku. Thank you.
Next, we have Mainza Tao with us today. Mainza is president and CEO of the Hmong American Partnership. She joined the partnership in 2021. Before that, she held a position at Minnesota Housing's sister over in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Housing and Economic Development Authority. But uh, this is the community that Mainza calls home. And so we're really excited, Mainza, to have you with us today. Thank you for coming. And also, you've had a chance to hear uh, from Mayor Abrams uh, to talk about this great community here in Maplewood, and we're glad to be a partner. So let me, let me come on over. Let's start with Ku. Ku, tell us a little bit about Gladstone Village. Thank you, Commissioner Hall. Thank you, Mayor Abrams. Uh, thank you, the, all the staffs at MHFA. Um, as the commissioner says, this is, uh, this is our fourth application round. And um, when we started this, um, Becky Landon of the Landon Group said to us, it's going to be a while. And we said, well, how long is a while? <laughs> and she's like, maybe three years. I go, really? Third year came by, so close, so close. Uh, but we, uh, we absolutely appreciate that, that, that the partnership. This is uh, 65 units, family-friendly, affordable housing. Um, before we started uh, our housing journey, there was a lot of developments out there, one, two bedrooms and stuff of that nature. Uh, we started looking at the affordable housing for family-friendly units because communities of colors have a little bit larger family units. And so, you know, we like the three bedrooms, the four bedrooms. Um, you know, we, uh, we believe that there are different, there are little nuance change that, that can make these units a lot more functional. Uh, because we do have larger families, we buy stuff in bulk. So when you guys go to Sam's, we're buying toilet papers in cases of 280 rolls, right? <laughs> can't put that in a little uh, closet, right? And so we're not buying six rolls from, uh, from, from Cub. We're, we're buying 280 rolls, right? For the Asian family, we're, we are buying rice at 100 pound bags. You need a place for those. As you, if you guys have any friends of colors and you're in their houses, you walk in, you see their shoes all over the place. We don't wear shoes in the house. So the entry, the opposite side of the door hinge needs to be a little bit wider so we can put our shoes there. So these little nuanced changes is what we think we bring to these units and which makes it a little bit more functional. This, the, this specific one here, again, it's larger units. We have some walk-up units, underground parking uh, and stuff of that nature. Kayla Shookman was very instrumental in our first affordable housing project. And Kayla, you'll be happy to Wait, hear Kayla. that. <laughs> you know, 60 units on, uh, in St. Paul, we opened to 860 applications, okay? We walked it, and everybody comes up to us and said, Ku, we never thought we can afford a place where there's underground parking, where it's pouring outside and we don't have to worry about our kids running to the car, where it's snowing outside, we don't have to worry about snow emergencies, where we have to go move the car, right? We never thought we'd have a place where, um, you know, we have uh, exercise equipment. We never thought we'd have a place where we have laundry uh, equipment that are larger so that we can wash our beddings and our comforters and stuff of that nature. Again, nuance changes that has a significant impact on the deliverability of these units. So, again, thank you to everyone and uh, to thank you for the uh, confidence and, uh, and for the award. So, Could you make me, uh, my father tells the story when he got out of the Marine Corps uh, he moved to New York City with a buddy and they bought a 100 pound bag of rice and they said if they didn't have a job by the time the rice was gone they were going to have to go someplace right. else. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Mayor, talk a little bit about what, uh, what this development means for the city of Maplewood. This development helps us in I think our dream of redeveloping Gladstone. As I said in my remarks, this is really the oldest part of Maplewood. This is where it all started. And you know, we have been investing over the years from this particular building, the, um, in terms of the, 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 the road out there on Frost Avenue, the infrastructure, we have been preparing for this for years. And you know, whenever I have driven through here, uh, I have just, dreamt of what this is going to look like. And I am so excited about being here. You know, we have this amazing park, 
with this beautiful lake if you go down Frost Avenue towards uh, the, the new development that we're here talking about today. We have the Savannah, which is an absolutely amazing park. Uh, it really celebrates the kind of the heritage of Maplewood. The, uh, that particular area used to be a roundhouse for locomotive repair. And if you go down to that park, I was down there uh, with my grandson uh, uh, this summer, and it is a testament to the history of Maplewood, that that's what it started out to be. And it is, all the playground equipment is all uh, related to the railroad. And you know there's markings where the roundhouse used to be. And it is a beautiful park with natural uh, you know, uh, plantings. And uh, we have just done so much waiting for the housing piece. And now, the housing piece is really happening. Uh, I mentioned you know, that we have other properties that are being developed along Frost. This whole Gladstone neighborhood is gonna be revitalized. And one thing in Maplewood, we are a welcoming community. We recognize that we need housing. Uh, we need a variety of housing options, and that's what we have. In this small area, we have a senior center. We have a building that is that caters to 62 and older. Uh, we will have a variety of price points uh, from 30 AMI to market rate. And it's just, it's such an exciting time. This is really important that this is really, I think, in, when you're a first ring, first ring suburb and we are probably about 95% developed, this is one of the final areas in Maplewood that needs to be developed and to be redeveloped. So it's, this is absolutely critical. I can't tell you, I just am so excited about this. It, it shows. Yeah. Well, thank you, I am. <laughs> this is truly an answer. So thank you, everyone. Mine's uh, in your leadership at the Hmong American Partnership. Uh, you work with a lot of families. Uh, Certainly the character of Ramsey County has changed a lot over the decades. Talk to me about what you hear in your work mm -hmm. about the need for housing and, and what this community has become for the Hmong community. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Um, and you know, first of all, I just have to say it's such an honor to be amongst such an esteemed uh, panel here, but really huge congratulations to J.B. Vang. Um, in the Hmong community, right, housing as in many of our underserved communities continues to be a challenge, affordable housing in particular. And Ku's project, the Gladstone project, that's what we need. We need developers who understand the cultural nuances of housing needs within our communities. I will share really quickly, I just moved back here uh, a year ago. And as I was looking for a rental property because housing was so expensive, um, for my own family, it was those little things that Ku talked about that I didn't even consciously, I was not even aware of that I was searching for, that, that bigger space to put shoes, truly. <laughs> and that makes all the difference because we have family and friends over all the time, right? Because we are a very communal community. And so it is these little uh, details that matter very much to our families. And why is that important? It's important because housing affects and the quality of housing and the affordability of housing affects the mental health. So that then becomes a public health issue. So it's all interconnected and that's why projects that are especially uh, developed by developers of color who are very sensitive to the needs of our underserved communities is so significant. And I have to say, Commissioner Ho, I'm so excited to hear about the intentionality of engaging more developers of color uh, where I recently came from in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, we had a growing number of what we called emerging developers, but who truly were developers of co color and redeveloping housing within communities that they came from. We saw the huge impact that made on our communities, the health and well-being, the pride to see someone who looked like them, to say, hey, we used to live in the projects now look at, we have a developer who came from the projects who now develops housing for us. There are so many significant social impact pieces to this project and it's just, it's amazing. It's amazing that this is the first housing project, you know, that J.B. Vang has 
worked with the Minnesota Housing on too. That's a huge milestone and it needs to be celebrated and we need to do more. I, um, well, we actually looked at what was happening in Wisconsin. Sometimes in Minnesota, we've got pride of getting there first, but we actually looked at what you were doing in Wisconsin and yes. we, borrowed, we borrowed some of your techniques into our process. Great. I am also glad that the JO companies, uh, Johnny O'Para, who just walked in the door, uh, is, is another persistent developer who's a part of the, our selections this year. Welcome, uh, Johnny, to this. Ku, I'm gonna give you the last word on this panel. What advice do you have, um, I mean, you, you You've got a long history of development in this community. You're new to us, but you're not new, right? Mm -hmm. But what advice do you have to developers who, you know, they think about doing a tax credit deal or something like that, and it just sounds complicated, the, the application is complicated. What advice do you have for folks who really want to get in the business of building housing and housing that's affordable for, for the communities that, that they come from and that they want to serve? The development is, uh, is it's something that, that requires a lot of the different things, right? So this is the only profession where you get a little bit of politics, a little bit of design, a little bit of financing, a little bit of construction. And so you kind of have to be that jack of all trades. And I've always, I've always told people this, is that I have no problem being the idiot in the, the room, okay? <laughs> Uh, when I started in development a long time ago, and, and Kayla has heard this story, so when I started in development a long time ago, I went to PED before Kayla and said, I'd like to do development, and they said, you don't have an experience. So I went out, 10 years later, I developed eight, $800 million worth of property, went back to PED before Kayla, and said, you have no housing experience. I go, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, okay, why don't you give me Who's the best attorney in, in, in housing development? Who's the best architect? Who's the best contractor? Who's the best consultant? So they told me, so I hired all four of them. I went back and I said, okay, there's gotta be room for one idiot in this room, in this, in this room. Can that be me? Just let me be the idiot, right? And so you have to surround yourself with the best people. I mean, I have Justin Fincher, who's our VP of development, Jackson, who runs numbers like there's no tomorrow, and the support staff and everybody else that's involved. And you need that team of, of, of professionals that knows that, that stuff, because as the commissioner said, it's incredibly complicated. You're talking about tens of millions of dollars dealing with other people's money, and you have to be a, uh, you have to be a good steward of, of the resources that the state has, as well as the private investors that are coming in. So. This is fantastic. Please join me in thanking our guests. We've been We're going to bring around the second panel. This is, our, this is our road show. This is our travelers. These are our hardcore <laughs> friends. They've uh, come down from Duluth and Grand Rapids. I think cumulatively that's probably four feet of snow between the two of them. <laughs> First, we have Diane Larson. Diane's the executive director of the Itasca Housing and Redevelopment Authority. She's here from Grand Rapids, which will soon be home to eight new homes. Um, uh, it's exciting to have the board uh, select them yesterday, and they're gonna be community land trust homes built in partnership with One Roof Community Housing. We're delighted to have Jeff Corey here. He's the executive director of One Roof. Had the opportunity to put a shovel in the ground and cut some ribbons with Jeff in the last four years. One Roof is a nonprofit developer that's based in Duluth, but they've got significant experience managing community land trusts. And with Jeff, we have Denise Kramer, a homeowner in Duluth, who holds a lease on her community land trust home, so she understands firsthand the benefits of the community land trust model, and she's also a board member with One Roof. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Diane, let's start, let's start with you. Talk about your vision of doing eight new homes in Grand Rapids? Well, uh, the mayor uh, here was excited, but we are super excited. We drove this far in a snowstorm to come because we're so <laughs> excited. Um, my vision is really twofold. It's, it's a short-term vision and a long-term vision that this award really brings to the community of Grand Rapids. We really have no one in our community up north that's developing affordable single-family homes. There's not a nonprofit, that there's not an organization doing that work in Itasca County. And what we see being developed is just the one and two Z custom homes where a family can afford to build that home. And so my vision for this is, first and foremost, 
In the short term, we are going to be able to bring eight new single family homes to our community that are affordable, that will have long term affordability tied to them um, for our growing workforce and for our families in our community. So I'm super excited about that. And my long term vision really adds to that in that with our partners across the county line and them stepping up to provide us technical assistance, I am super excited that we can grow this program, we can grow our expertise to be able to continue to do this in our communities. So we don't view this vision as just eight homes, although that's significant in our community. We view this as a long-term relationship where the HRA is going to be able to continue this work. That's, that's fantastic. Jeff, can you just explain wh what the community land trust model is and how it creates affordability for people to become homeowners? A absolutely. Uh, so a community land trust is actually a tool that can be used for lots of different community benefits. There's some, some examples in the Twin Cities of it being used for economic development, but it's basically a tool for access to land for a community purpose. And when it comes to affordable home ownership, uh, community land trust homes typically are homes that are af affordable to folks uh, that are that otherwise wouldn't be able to purchase a market market rate home. And so we we maintain ownership of the land under the homes that we develop and help develop. And in that in that lease that we have with the homeowner for the land is a resale formula that ensures that when the house is sold in the future, it's, it's sold affordably and available only to another income eligible family. And, and so that's the, you know, one way of describing it. Another, another quick way is you, you know, that, that land trust home typically is 20 to 35% below market value in, in terms of the cost to that family. And so the family that buys the home knows that they get into a house that they otherwise would not have accessibility to. And in exchange for that, they're paying it forward when they sell the house in the future to another income eligible family. And so it's, it's a way to sort of take community resources today to create affordable homes and to have those homes be affordable long term. And real quickly, we've got <laughs> 335 or so land trust homes in our portfolio ranging from Cook County to, to Carleton County with a whole bunch in Duluth and St. Louis County and over 200 of those have resold. So because we did it that way in the first place, we've served another 200 plus families. So this is your westward expansion here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, Denise, I mean, you had to get your head around this. So talk a little bit just about uh, your thought process from, from where you were living and how you made the decision to buy uh, a home uh, that's a part of the land trust. Sure. So. I was fresh out of college getting a four-year degree and was living in rental housing throughout the Duluth community and the housing stock in Duluth is very old and is very rental heavy and what we make for wages versus what we pay in rent, it's, it doesn't work. Um, and so I sort of found myself in this loop, stuck. like. I can't save enough to be able to get into a home because I'm paying rent to live now in a space that's too small for me. And so I had a friend actually that had benefited from one of the One Roof programs and she suggested that I look into it. So I contacted them and I worked with their staff and actually it was over a year's time to get myself really to the place where I was ready mm -hmm. to get into a home. And I will just say the process, the staff, at One Roof, they're fantastic at what they do. They're compassionate people and they really, they care about the work that they do. And the, the day, it was a snowy day, <laughs> like today, when we moved into our house and it was just such a fantastic experience and um, I wouldn't change it for anything. I remember the day that that my partner and I bought our home, I think my hand shook <laughs> as I was signing paper after paper after paper, because it was like a 30 year commitment. It was like the, the, the biggest step that I had, had ever taken. Diane, uh, Grand Rapids, like so many communities uh, around the state, um, kind of mid-size, a regional hub. Uh, you know, it, it's where you go for groceries. It's, it's where I pick up my fishing license. I, um, <laughs> but just in terms of thinking about with the, the politics and the community, talk about the conversation 
around moving into the community land trust space. Um, thank you, Commissioner Ho. Um, and you're right, Grand Rapids is really the, the, the regional hub for our area. And, um, you know, we started talking about, uh, you know, no one's developing single family housing. Um, the city of Grand Rapids was trying to attract developers through many different means to come into our community. That wasn't working. So we started having these conversations at the HRA. We had been successful in doing some multifamily development. We do a lot of typical HRA work. And the city came to us and said, can't you help us do this? How can we figure this out? And, um, and um, we've, we've got a workforce um, that's growing. Um, and the city is saying to us, where are all these workers going to live? And so really, when we started looking at single family development, it was how can we make this affordable? And an opportunity came to us with the technical assistance from One Roof. Um, but I think more than that, we said, as an HRA, our mission is to create affordable housing opportunities. And so the community land trust model allows us to do that because it's not just the first family that that house is affordable to, and then when they sell it, it's no longer affordable because of the appreciation of that home, but it becomes affordable to the second family and the third family and the fourth family. So it certainly meets the mission of the HRA into cr trying to create these longer term, sustainable, affordable housing options um, for the families in our community. Jeff, you talked about over 200 uh, families have left and you've been able to, to resell to other families. Talk a little bit about when families are ready to leave, the benefits they have and where they're going to next. Great question, Commissioner. Uh, I would say that uh, the vast majority of folks that leave community land trust home ownership, for, in our experience, move on to a, purchase a market rate home. And uh, I forget the exact stat, but it's in the it's in the 80 to 85 percent range is sort of where it's hovered over the years. And so, it really is a situation where, when folks are ready to move, they they typically do. And and there there are reasons why some folks stay for a long term. Um, they can range from my family is a part of this community and while I could move into a different house somewhere in the region, I want to stay in this community. Um, and sometimes it's folks that haven't moved up the income ladder much, but they can continue to have a sustainable life in, in that home. But the ones that do move on, most of them are by, buying a house. Um, yeah. Denise, I'm going to give you the last word. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of households in Minnesota that earn enough to pay a mortgage, um, but they've been renters their whole lives. Uh, maybe they, uh, they're the first, they would be the first person in their family to buy a home. What's your advice for somebody who is weighing that decision between rental and home ownership, whether it's through a community land trust model or, or, or through another vehicle? What's your advice to people who are thinking about it? So I think a really great example um, in my life now. I've been in my land trust home for since 2012, so I'm one of those long-term folks that Jeff was talking about. We've been redoing the back room for our five-year-old son. You have so many opportunities when it's yours to own, mm -hmm. when it's yours to change. If you have a doorway that doesn't fit your shoes, you can change it. <laughs> and it's just, there's so much more value in planting your roots in a community. You're not looking at um, your rent being raised, though nothing's gotten better. It's just been such a fantastic opportunity for my growing family to be able to have a place to call our own. And that we know that when we decide to move on from that space, that someone else is gonna have the same opportunity that we did. And it's just, it's a fantastic model. And I'm so glad to hear that it's expanding to another community. We have 30, 335 community land trust homes in, in our community land trust. All but five have significant investment from Minnesota Housing. Um, so it, we couldn't do this without Minnesota Housing. It would, we'd be dead in the water. And we so couldn't do you. it without the investments of the Minnesota legislator. Sure, so please thank your uh, state uh, representative and, and senators for their investments in housing. I would love to sit and talk with you forever. It feels like it's, it's all cut short, but I'm very, very grateful and really grateful for the work that you're doing and for the model that you are creating, not just for the families that you're gonna help, but to inspire other communities. 
uh, to make the investments and, and continue the work. Thank you so much. While I have a captive audience, I would be remiss if I didn't just mention that for people who are homeowners and behind, uh, we have a great program called Home Help MN, uh, and it helps people get caught up if they're behind, if they're homeowners, homehelpmn.org. So I just want to mention that. I, um, and it's a temporary program, but we still have funding that's available. And I just uh, really, really, really feel the excitement of today. I, uh, today's, today is the middle of a journey, right? It's, uh, it's the application process. It's the perseverance for coming back in. It's building on the legacy of other work that's been done. And now we'll have a process before we even get the shovels in the ground um, of, of working through all the closing documents and getting the financing together. But uh, I just am pleased uh, to have the opportunity to continue as commissioner. And I look forward to showing up for the groundbreakings and the ribbon cuttings and the celebration of welcoming new families home. Thank you so much, everybody.